From WAMU in Washington, I'm Susan Page of USA Today. Islam is the world's fastest growing religion. Scholar Karen Armstrong argues that it may also be the most misunderstood. In her new book, she traces its complex history. Her book is called Islam, A Short History. Welcome to the Diane Reem Show. Thank you very much. Well, Karen Armstrong, how did you come to write this book? Well, simply uh, a friend of mine rang me up and asked me if I'd like to do it. Uh, but I, I rather jumped at the chance because um, I think Islam is not much misunderstood. And I think that the, the, it was a challenge for me to write uh, such a complex and uh, about such a complex uh, issue in such a short space of time. 50,000 words is virtually nothing. But I thought it's a, a kind of unthreatening size and people might just pick it up where they might uh, shy away a little bit from something rather more huge and formidable and, I, and just begin to understand. It's, it's, a, it's a taster really uh, to, to get people into the Islamic way of thought and to see the immense richness of, of the tradition. This the book is about 200 pages long, not really a very daunting task to read, although very interesting. Did you know a lot about Islam before you started? I've been studying Islam now for, for years. Um, I wrote, um, nearly 10 years ago, I wrote a biography of the Prophet Muhammad at the time of the Salman Rushdie crisis because I was concerned uh, about the hatred um, in the air on both sides at that time. And it seemed to me a great pity that uh, most Western people had no understanding of the Prophet's life at all. Um, they, there was no readily accessible biography of the Prophet for Western readers. And so I, I, I wrote about um, Islam too in my History of God. And I've been interested in Islam ever since I visited Jerusalem for the first time and there became um, fascinated in the interrelationship between the three monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and, and how similar they are, and, and how profoundly, uh, deeply related, interconnected, and sometimes, of course, there's been great hostility between the three faiths. What was life like for Arabs at the point that the Islamic religion began? Well, grim in a word. Um, Muhammad began his uh, mission in about 610 um, AD. And uh, he, at that point, uh, his city of Mecca uh, in the middle of what is now Saudi Arabia uh, was undergoing a huge um, economic upheaval. For the first time, the Meccans had managed to establish a market economy and they were rich beyond their wildest dreams. But the rest of Arabia was in a fearful state. Uh, the, there were just simply, there was just simply not enough food to go around. It's a ve very, very bleak terrain, as you know. Um, and so the tri various tribes were endlessly competing with one another for the dwindling and limited resources, and that meant that they were caught up in a series of awful tribal warfares um, and bloody vendettas that led to counter vendettas. And similarly in Mecca, uh, because of the new market economy, because of the new wealth, the old tribal uh, traditions were going down the drain and people were, uh, some people getting very rich were going to the war, whereas the old tribal th uh, ethos had always insisted that you looked after the vulnerable members of the tribe and that, that you didn't have inequalities. And there was a spiritual malaise. The Arabs uh, felt, had knew about Judaism and Christianity which um, they felt were more advanced religions. And many of the Arabs uh, believed that the high god, Allah, of their pantheon was the same as the god worshipped by the uh, Jews and the Christians. But uh, the Christians, in particular, with whom they came in contact, used to jeer at them and say that God had never bothered to send them a prophet and uh, that, that they ne had no scriptures in their own language. And so they felt left out of the divine plan and stranded, but that changed. Uh, on the night that Muhammad, uh, who was making a retreat on Mount Hira above the city of Mecca, suddenly felt himself in a, enveloped in a powerful divine presence and heard uh, and the words of the, this great Arab scripture began pouring from his lips. What 
do we know about Muhammad the man? We know much more about Muhammad the man than, the, than about the founder of any other faith, because he's just that much later. Um, and he was a man. Um, I, he, he was not God. He always insisted that he was not um, um, in any way uh, divine and had faults just like everybody else. Uh, but he, uh, he, was a, he was a genius, in a word. Uh, one of the greatest geniuses he was, uh, the, the world has probably seen. He was a poetic genius. However, you, if you choose to in, look at the inspiration of the Quran, the Quran uh, is, is written in the most astonishing poetry. Uh, that still fills Muslims with wonder and awe. Um, and it was the beauty of the Quran that convinced the first Mus many of the first Muslims to convert. But as well as being an absolute spiritual genius, he was also uh, had political gifts of a very high order. And within a, a few, mere 20 years or so, he had managed to unite the war-torn Arabia under the banner of Islam. Now, Muhammad could not read or write. He, but he would recite, yes. and this formed really the Quran. This, uh, the, these, um, over the next 23 years, uh, he received these revelations from God, um, and he would recite them, and people would learn these by heart. Um, and later they were collected in what we now, and arranged in what we now have as, as, as the Quran. You talked just a moment ago about how beautiful the language is in the Quran. Do, do you yourself speak Arabic? Have you I, sent that? I'm learning it, um, and, but I'm, I'm, I'm a bit old uh, to learn new languages, and, and Arabic is very difficult. Uh, but I, yeah, there was a moment very early uh, in my acquaintanceship with Islam that really struck me. I was uh, in Israel making a television program. Um, and my driver was a Palestinian, and he was driving me home through the West Bank at night. And he picked up some of his friends to give them a lift. And these were all beer-drinking young men, and they never went near the mosque. And suddenly the Quran came on the car radio. Now, if I'd been driving, which is a pretty godless place, with some beer-drinking youths, and the New Testament came on the, 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 the air, I can see people just lunging for the off button. But these Palestinians, suddenly they were wrapped, and they started trying to uh, translate these beautiful words. They're, they're words falling over one another in their eagerness to try to com convey the beauty of this. And they were saying, you know, oh, Karen, I wish you could understand this. It's so beautiful. And I thought, this is remarkable. Uh, this is remarkable that the Quran still has this profound magical effect. It is a sonoral recitation. It's called, the Quran means recitation. So it's meant to be listened to. Um, and the beauty of the words was one, of, as I say, was one of the first things that convinced the Muslims to listen to the, the, the Arabic, to, to, the, to the message of Muhammad, which seemed miraculous. But translated into English, it loses some of that well, power. Well, anything does. Yeah. Even Shakespeare sounds absurd in French, um, and the Quran certainly just just doesn't. It doesn't have the same the same the same ring. But it is beautiful. You can, when you hear it chanted as it is uh, on to a special chant, it it really is evocative and powerful. Now, Muhammad is not considered a divine figure in the, no. this religion. No. How is he viewed today? Oh, uh, again, one of the things that struck me uh, very, very forcibly uh, talking to these young Palestinians was how deeply they loved Muhammad. Um, and Muhammad is regarded as the, the perfect man because his life, they feel, embodied the perfect act of Islam, a word that means surrender to the divine. Um, and so Muslims model their behavior on the Prophet's life. You talked about the grim state of affairs for Arabs at the point that Muhammad first received a revelation. What was the situation by the time he died in 632? Well, by the time he died, um, he, he had, uh, as I say, united uh, the, the Arab tribes under him. Um, and um, some of them broke away. Um, and some of them started to try, you challenged his prophethood. But gradually, it's, it's, what had happened was that is Islam had worked. Things had changed in the Arabian Peninsula. And people found that the old paganism no longer spoke to their new conditions. And, much, and the Arabs are deeply practical people. And they felt that this, this was the way to go forward. They then uh, began to invade 
the surrounding territories. Now, it's important. Western people have a, a, a wrong idea of this. They often, people often assume that they were impelled by the ferocious power of Islam to pour out into the neighboring countries and convert all the people at sword point. Nothing is further from the truth. The Arabs for centuries had been breaking out of the deserts of Arabia into the settled lands, but this time they met